Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Scott. I'm an alcoholic. And because of a loving God that you people have introduced me to. I'm gone already. Uh, I haven't had a drink since April 22nd, 1985. I, I started crying while I was sitting down there. Colleen got up and she said the beautiful thing that you guys say out here, you know, where you tell everybody what they're, you know, this is who I am, this is how long I've got this thing. And I just welled up. I just, uh... I love being here. I love being with you guys. It's my Midwestern home group. I have a lot of people who are very important to me in this room. Uh, A lot of people who I really love. A guy who I sponsor is here. My friend Dick and and, uh, and, uh, a lot of friends, Mark and Zelda, and a lot of people who I just have known uh, for a long time. I I, I first came out, the first time I ever talked out of town, which I thought was a bizarre thing that they'd you know, they asked me to, I thought I was being set up for a hit or something. I didn't know what to, I come from the Bronx and it's not impossible, you know, and, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, the first time I ever talked out of town was, uh, at a, a mini conference in Omaha and I fell in love with you people then and have been in love with you ever since. And, uh, um, I just, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you asked me to come out this weekend. I'll be talking for 75 hours today, and uh, I'll be giving my meatloaf recipe out by about 5 o'clock, and uh, I'll be, the, the, the schedule's a little different this afternoon. I talked to Dick about it. We'll talk about that later, um, but we'll, we'll start out this morning. I, uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about the steps, and uh, I... Uh, We'll be making references to two non, uh, uh, non-conference approved pieces of literature. I'll tell you what they are now so we can just get out of that, the way. My, my personal favorite history of Alcoholics Anonymous is a book called Not God, written by a guy named Kurtz. Uh, it's a non-conference approved uh, piece of literature, so if you're new, it's not something you have to read. It's just it, You're going to hear me uh, make some references to it as the day goes by. I, I have found it to be something that has enriched my uh, sobriety. Uh, and the other piece of literature is a book by Emmett Fox called The Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. It, it, the fact is, is it's one of the pieces of literature that was being read by the, the people who framed the big book of AA. And in it, there is there are things in it like, the you know, Bill makes reference in the big book to uh, varieties of, of uh, spiritual experience by a guy named William James. And in that book, which Bill was reading before they framed the big book, People tell their stories. They tell their individual stories about how they had a spiritual experience. And, you know, it's pretty clear that that's one of the reasons, you know, one of the things that was being taken advantage of by Bill and the early AAs and the Oxford group of telling your story, of identification, and, and uh, you know, apparently one of the reasons why we so much of our book is dedicated to personal stories because ultimately that's all I have is my story. And this is different for me today because I'm being asked to do something that I normally try to not do. When I give a talk in AA, I might think, start thinking I'm so uh, sort of, you know, uh, accomplished as a, a, an alcoholic, a bizarre <laughs> phrase, I think, uh, in the upper echelon of degeneracy, uh, that, <laughs> that I could actually stop telling my story and start commenting on AA as a whole, the sweep of history, um, the state of the, the art, and then I'm, I, I think I'm dead. I could become a circuit drinker pretty easy at that point. And uh, I, I have, uh, you know, and I can talk about different things. I, I, uh, a friend of mine in AA talks about AA trends. I, I love to hear him talk because he's, uh, he's one of these guys with 45 years who says, he, from his point of view, there is no good old days. You know, the good old days the better be right now. They better be right now, and if they're not, you, you ought to take a look at what you're doing, you know? Because it says in our book, a fellowship will spring up around you, and you can have the fellowship that you crave in AA. That has been my experience, and the minute I give up on that, then I'll start pointing a finger and saying, boy, it's really turned to crap. And it has, because I have. Uh, and... um and I'm and, and so I really feel very strongly that I have to tell my story. And I'm being I'm going to tell my story today, but I've been asked to do a little bit more. So I'm going to endeavor to do that and talk about my personal experience with the steps. I have a, a sort of a, a request to make of you and a challenge to make of you. 
I am going to ask you, as plead with you, implore you, to not take anything I say today as an indictment of what you're doing with the steps of the program. I have no idea how you should do this. I do not think for one second that I do it right. I know I do it perfectly for me. I haven't had a damn drink in 14 years. And I cannot stop drinking. I had uh, hand surgery uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was told that I needed a uh, general anesthetic. Oh, general anesthetic. <laughs> oh. oh, general anesthetic. Normal people don't get excited about general anesthetic. They do. Normal people don't go, oh, general anesthetic. And I'll tell you why. You're asleep for general anesthetic. You don't get to stay up and be and enjoy general anesthetic. That's why they call it. You're generally anesthetized. But I'll tell you why I love it. <laughs> when, they give, when they give it to you, they say count backwards from 100. So you go 199, boom. I love 99. I love 99. <laughs> 99. <laughs> but here's the difference. I won't trade my life in for 99 anymore. And I never got, you know, I only had 99 a couple of times. Then I just spent the rest of my life chasing 99. I'd see 99. I'd hear other people talk about 99, but I only had 99 a couple of times. I just traded my life in for it. I live like a loser. Loser, 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 loser. I settled for a nickel today when I could have a quarter tomorrow every day of the week. And one of the reasons that they say stay in today, live in today, get right in the middle of that clap, live it one day at a time, uh, which is one of the things Emmett Fox talks so beautifully about when he, he uh, takes uh, apart the Sermon of the Mount sentence by sentence and he ta uh, discusses the section on resist not evil, which I'm going to talk more about today. Don't make oaths. Don't make proclamations. Stay right here, right now. He talks about it perfectly, you know. Um, there is nothing new in the 12 steps. If you've studied them at all, uh, you'll know that these are ancient ideas. Their ideas, uh, AA didn't come up with anything new. They came up with a way, a presentation. They came up with a way that, so that alcoholics could buy the package. And they worked diligently, very hard, right up to the last moment of pressing that big book. They had to keep making changes to keep the loopholes out. Now, I know that if you're new, this probably is not going to work for you. We're too, we've got a membership of 2 million, 2 million people. We're in 150 countries. We've got 98,000 groups, but I'm sure we won't be able to help you. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, the, the group that we came from, the Oxford group, uh, experienced something similar to a group called the Washingtonians. And if you've studied AA history at all, uh, the Washingtonians are a fascinating group uh, to take a look at. They were a group dedicated to the cause of sobriety that went away just like the Oxford group pretty much for the same reason. They got into politics, they got into money, property, and prestige, they got into personalities and celebrity. And uh, the fact that their leader was trying to make contact with Hitler during the Second World War didn't really help him a lot, but, uh, but I, I judge no man. And, um, uh, <laughs> the Washingtonians were huge. In order for us to have a group the size of the Washingtonians in the United States right now, AA has 2 million people membership roughly uh, internationally. We would have to have 10 million people in AA in America alone in order to equal the size and ratio of the Washingtonians. We're talking huge. Uh, Abraham Lincoln talked at one of their commencements. They don't exist. People don't know about them. Only people, my experience is the only people who know about them is the people in AA who use them as as a lesson, <laughs> you know, and it's because from my point of view and, and from the experience of a lot of other people I respect, it's they they took the turn that we have constantly. What a beautiful thing that you guys read the 12 concepts here and, and, and which is sort of the, you know, if you're new, it's uh, one of the great corporate diagrams I've ever seen in my life. If you get the pamphlet that talks about GSO and, and the concepts, it has a, a, I believe, I don't know if it still does, but it used to have a a pyramid in it. It's upside down. And the rank and file is on the top, and uh, the trustees are on the bottom. You can't get lower than a trustee. A trustee is the lowest, the, the least powerful human being 
and Alcoholics Anonymous. And some of them believe that and some of them don't. And, uh, um, but again, I, I judge no man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's, the, there's no reason why AA should work. Uh, the original alcoholic board kept on telling Bill, you don't have enough rules, and Bill kept saying the thing that we know is true. We know it today probably better than we ever have before. They've got alcoholism. Alcoholism will take care of it. It will school them. They don't need any other beaten. They're getting the big beaten. <laughs> and no one can beat them like alcoholism can. Um, so I, I ask you uh, during today, please don't take uh, anything I say as an indictment. I'm going to share uh, how I've taken the steps. That's what I'm going to tell you about. And I, I don't pretend, uh, and I've done some stuff that's probably uh, different from you. You've probably done some stuff that's different from me. But I don't think I know any better than you. Um, <clears throat> the steps, as seen by uh, Dr. Silkworth, Silkworth saw them as, as something he referred to as moral psychology. That they, uh, that they felt for a long time in the treatment of alcoholism that some form of moral psychology, which I never understood until the last couple of years. I never understood what moral psychology was. I had been in psychotherapy for 18 years by the time I got to AA. I was going to be dead, but I was going to understand it. <laughs> and um, I'm not putting therapy down. It's great stuff. It says on page 133 of our book, if you need a doctor, go get one. I got no beef with therapy. My colossal blunder is that I was trying to treat my alcoholism with psychotherapy, which is like showing up at a, at a gunfight with a knife once a week, you know, and just getting this colossal ass whooping, just whoop, 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 but doing good work in therapy, but just getting creamed because I was trying to treat this threefold illness, this bizarre physical reaction to alcohol, mm -mm -mm, general anesthetic, coupled with uh, this weird, weird thinking that turned into this spiritual tapeworm, this soul sickness, this cancer in my heart that, that, uh, that near to killed me. And um, what, I, what I got after a while, since the whole purpose of this exercise, this is AA is such not a self-help group. It is the antithesis of the whole notion of self-help. Uh, one of my favorite people who I'll be talking about today, uh, who's no longer with us, he died sober with over 20 years, my friend Howard Cooper, who I just adored. When I was really new, I was six months sober, he was an old timer, and I was at the AA feed for Thanksgiving, you know, the hell, right? Supposed to be at the head of a magnificent table with my admiring family, who are all like this, you know, by that time. And, uh, and there I am, you know, at the AA trough, you know, you know, witnessing the miracle. Uh, I, I was so happy to be there. And, uh, um, Howard walked up to me and said, How are you? And I went, Fine. And he said, You know, you don't have to be fine for me. And I went, <laughs> just broke down and blubbered and he held me I just oh man did I need to not be fine for a minute it was just that you know um and uh <clears throat> when I started to find out well the thing that Howard told me he was a, a skid row bum ex skid row bum who had been thrown out of the Salvation Army which is you know a, a personal best for anybody I know um <laughs> He said, the first, you know those little, uh, uh, I don't know if you have them out here, but when people sell stuff on the street, they sell books with the cover ripped off or a quarter or something like that. And down on Skid Row, he said, the first thing the guys do is they get the self-help books. They go and they spend, because they think they can think their way off of Skid Row. And I've never, I've heard Alcoholics Anonymous in the press refer to as a self-help group. I've seldom heard anything further from the truth. Since uh, our whole society seems to be driven trying to drive home one simple fact. You can't help yourself. If you continue to try to run this thing on self-will or self-propulsion, you're going to trade yourself out. It's like those stockbrokers who keep just trading you. Ding, ding, ding. Sorry, all your money's gone, but you did great. <laughs> it's the same thing as alcoholism. that You just get traded out until there's nothing left. And... Um, uh, when Bill went to the Oxford group, um, after his friend showed up at his home and had, uh, had gotten religion, um, and he started going to the Oxford group, the Oxford group had four things that they called the four absolutes. 
and the, uh, they believed in absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. Bill writes about, in uh, Not God, this quote is printed, the principles of honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love are as much a goal of AA members and are as much practiced by them as any other group of people. Yet we found that when the word absolute was put in front of these attributes, they either turned people away by the hundreds or gave them a temporary spiritual inflation resulting in collapse. <laughs> the average alcoholic just couldn't stand the pace and got nowhere. What a, what a beautiful expression of it. Because the only thing I ever did absolutely was I got absolutely loaded. That, 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 absolutely. And you were absolutely a moron by the time I got there. Those were the absolutes as understood by Scott Redmond. And uh, um, one of the things I love, and I think that Bill would get a tremendous kick off. As a matter of fact, there's a tape where he even talks about it. There's a tape where he talks about the writing of the book. And he says, I understand that certain people have started to kind of iconize the big book. You know, that uh, a friend of mine you know, knows a guy who has a little shrine with a first edition, you know, in the corner. And, and uh, they wrote it as a, as a fundraising tool. These guys were trying to put some dough together. And they were writing it chapter by chapter. And they go, give us money. And they go, no. <laughs> I mean, it was like, and at the same time, they knew that they had to get out of text. But Bill was a promoter. You know, I'm a Bill trying to be a Bob. You know, that, that, I mean, that, I, I don't know if you've ever been in a room full of bobs, but it's a snore. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a snore. And without them, we'd be dead. We'd be dead because it'd just be all bills. A bunch of self-promoting, you know, blabber mouth boneheads like me. I mean, I'm just, I am, I'm a bill aspiring to be as bobbish as I possibly can be. <laughs> So, Bill had a talk. They had written uh, the first four chapters, and now he had to go write chapter five. And he realized, this is it. I mean, I'm going to have to put this thing down. I'm going to have to do it now. I have to now codify what we're doing. He had a conversation with some friends of his, as it's outlined in the historical material, and they had so they put together what they had been doing in sort of a six-step thing. I used to think, because of the mention of the six-step program in the big book, in one of the personal stories, that there was actually a six-step. It was just a smaller piece of thing, you know, just half this size with six steps. And in fact, it wasn't codified in that way. It's something they came up with and said, well, apparently this is what we've been doing. And um, it's in AA Comes of Age, Bill describes the beginning experience of having to sit down with us. He says, so the job until we reached the famous chapter five, up to that time I had done my own story and I had drafted three more chapters. There is a solution more about alcoholism, we agnostics. We now realize we had enough background, enough window dressing material, and at this point we had to tell, we had, uh, we had to tell our program of recovery from alcoholism how it really worked. The backbone of the book would have to be fitted in right there. Sprawling on his bed and in anything but spiritual mood, one evening Wilson poised his yellow pencil above the school tablet prop before him. Quickly, lest he block, he scrawled the words out how it works across the top of the page. Then paused to meditate about the six-step procedure with his and his associates at the previous meeting had agreed pretty well summed up what they had learned from the Oxford group. One, we admitted we were licked, that we were powerless over alcohol. Two, we made an inventory of our defects or sins. Three, sins, what an attractive word. Three, uh, we confessed or shared our shortcomings with another person in confidence. Four, we made restitution to all those we had harmed by our drinking. Five, we tried to help other alcoholics with no thought of reward or money or pres in money or prestige. Six, we prayed to whatever God we thought there was for power to practice these precepts. And that's what he wrote. And then he sat and he wrote his draft, which we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna read in a second, his original draft of the fifth chapter of the book, which is different, considerably different than the fifth chapter of the book as it exists. And then one of the things which I just, I, only in Alcoholics Anonymous could this have happened. After he finished writing, a friend of his who he sponsored came over with a newcomer barely dry three months. And it, it, he writes, this is again in AA Comes of Age, I was greatly pleased with what I had written. I read them the new version of the program, now the 12 steps. Howard and his friend reacted violently. <laughs> so there's a guy... There's a puke with three months going, I don't like that. I, why 12 steps? Um, 
<laughs> so this newcomer busted his chops. He says, why 12 steps, they demanded. You've got too much God in those steps. They'll scare people away. <laughs> and then, then they said, what do you mean by getting those drunks down on their knees when they have to ask all their short, when they have to ask for all their shortcomings removed? And then, and this had to be the guy with three months. This is my favorite. Who wants all their shortcomings removed anyhow? <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous. Our, our deity, Bill Wilson's there, and he goes, the, the new guy, the new guy walks and says, ah, this, ah, <laughs> I don't like that. And Bill started changing it. <laughs> I want to ask my friend Brent to come up and join me for a second. And uh, what I want Brent to do, you got it? Is read chapter five, and, and what he's going to do is he's going to stop when I tap him on the shoulder. Every time we reach a point, where the original draft was different, and I'm going to tell you what the original draft said. So just to show you how much it, this was from the original draft that was sent around to the groups before the groups had their input, groups. I mean, two groups. Uh, <laughs> come a little closer in here. And um, this is how the uh, or original draft changed from what Bill wrote and uh, input from the newcomer <laughs> and some other people and what we wound up with today. Chapter 5, how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Our directions. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. A way of life. <clears throat> Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. You are ready to follow directions. At some of these, we balked. At some of these, you may balk. <laughs> We thought we could find an easier, softer way. You may way. think you can find an easier or softer way. But we could not. We doubt if you can. <laughs> <laughs> with, all earnest, with all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol. Do, remember that you are dealing with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. It is too much for you. <laughs> but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. You must find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. You stand at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Throw yourself under his protection and care. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. Now we think you can take it. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as your program of recovery. <clears throat> One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. To the care and direction of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. We're entirely willing that God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Humbly, on our knees, asked him to remove our shortcomings, holding nothing back. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Willing to make complete amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of this course of action, we try to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us exclaimed, You may exclaim, What an order. I can't go through with it. 
Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. Have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. <laughs> A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. A, that you are an alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. <laughs> B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. Probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism. C, that God could and would if he were sought. C, that God can and will. And then the next line, which is no longer in the chapter at all. If you are not convinced of these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. Brent was saying before, Bill probably put that in because he probably thought, well, they'll throw the book away, but then they'll have to come by and buy another one, and it's kind of a marketing tool. Uh, <laughs> I would have thrown mine away as fast as I, I would have just, that sucker would have sailed, baby. Really glad they took that up. The use of the word you versus we and I is, uh, is unbelievably, it's stunning to me. Thank God. What a great thing. What a great thing that they turned that corner. You know, and it's mirrored throughout the whole book. Right through to the family after where it talks about no alcoholic likes to be told that they can't drink. Nobody. I mean, in the world of temperance, and this was, you know, a huge turn from the Washingtonians and the Oxford group. Nobody wants to be proselytized. Nobody wants to be told what they can and can't do, especially a drunk. Um, there are uh, a lot of attempts that I made in my life um, to be rid of the alcoholic dilemma. Nothing ever worked for me except for the 12 steps of AA. Judaism didn't work for me. As a matter of fact, I couldn't possibly have even been an alcoholic because I was Jewish. Uh, <laughs> Jews do not drink because it might dull the pain. And, uh, <laughs> you don't want to waste any agony opportunity. And one of the beautiful things in our book that it talks about over and over again is it doesn't argue. They refuse to argue. When priests come to AA, when ministers, when rabbis, when Buddhist monks come here, and it says in our book, it says it over and over again, and it says it in chapter 7, don't argue with them. Don't tell them you know God better than him, them. They can, they can quote the Bible chapter and verse. Say to them, you know this, but you are yellow in color. We seem to know God in a way we're able to bring that higher power's power to bear in a way that's released us from the cycle of spree and remorse, and you haven't. I'm not saying I know God better than you. I'm saying I just, I'm doing something that you're not doing yet. And uh, it, 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 it talks about never, ever um, uh, arguing with a drunk. Um, one of the things in the book that I, I, uh, I can't believe that they didn't change, which I always get a huge kick of, it, is uh, in the, there's, a there's many, many lists of promises throughout the entire big book. My favorite thing, and I always, when I'm having a tough time in my life, when I'm having a tough time uh, you know, wondering whether or not I can accomplish certain things in my life, I always like to go back to the list of what people commonly call the promises in the middle of, of the ninth step. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today, because the inception of AA really, you can date it from the minute that, that Dr. Bob started working his ninth step. They really knew how important this amend step was going to be. And really, they give them kind of more than any other place in the book, the most different kinds of things you can do, examples of different actions you can take. They really spend a lot of time on the ninth step and talk about the, how important uh, it is to be thorough there, because Dr. Bob really didn't stop drinking until he made those rounds that night after the last binge. So I really always try to remember that AA's inception really dates from when our co-founder finally jumped that fence. He was scared that people would know he was a drunk. <laughs> um, and um, they promise, they say you will experience a freedom from fear of financial insecurity. It was 1937. Global financial collapse. 
people diving off buildings, people, grown men selling apples for a nickel in the street. If there had been a PR guy involved in this, he would have said, don't, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> don't. Promise him anything. Promise him anything, but don't, don't do that. <laughs> it, it, it's the most outlandish, outrageous thing they could have possibly told people were, that were going to happen. I love my mother's stories about the depression because gets, she gets poorer every time she talks about it. You know? <laughs> we ate the shower curtains. We, uh, um, but I, <laughs> but I, I know it was bad. I know it was bad, and, and you couldn't really, in, in terms of, of promotion, I don't think any PR guy in his right mind would have let them let that stick, but they did. Um, step one, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life has become unmanageable. Two, I have come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. There are no written instructions in the big book of AA on how to work the first two steps. There are written specific instructions on how to take Every other step in the big book of AA, there are no specific written instructions on how to take the first two. We can, uh, I, a lot of people do a lot of different kinds of writing and exercises on the first two steps, and I think they're all fabulous. I did them when I was new. I, uh, I, I just can't imagine any exercise that anybody could do to get closer to God that would be, that where you could say, well, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I think they're all great ideas. Um, when you uh, read uh, the first three pages of chapter 5, by the time you get to the middle of page 60, it says, Our description of the alcoholic, the chapters of the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. So, if you've read the first three chapters, the chapters on alcoholism, the chapter of the agnostic, four, and our personal adventures before and after, I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean before I got sober, after I got sober, or the personal stories in the front of the book or the back of the book? I don't much really care. But whatever that means, if I've given that some thought, if I've read the first four chapters, if I've given some thought, to those personal adventures, it says here that it should make clear three basic concepts. Now, of course, in what we just read, it says, if you don't think you're an alcoholic, <laughs> reread the book up to this point or throw it away. But what they wound up with, it should make clear three ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God couldn't would if he were sought. Being convinced we were at step three. So somewhere in those three pertinent ideas, I am able to take those first two steps on whatever level, and on the first level I took them on, I took them on a very primitive level compared to, I mean, how was I to really appreciate the unmanageability of my life until not only I wrote it down in the form of an inventory, but then had to go and take responsibility for it and apologize and make amends. I mean, I want to tell you, the level I was able to take those first two steps with, it, with the help and support of that other work was vastly, vastly bigger, huger. And if I continue to take inventory and do that work, my appreciation of those first two steps will increase. I won't become part of the Frozen Chosen, the advanced course in Alcoholics Anonymous, where I start losing touch with that. Anytime I hear a, new, a, a person with time get to a podium and say, geez, I feel brand new again, I always say to myself, because I judge no man, I always say to myself, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't feel new. You might feel like crap. I'm not telling you you don't feel like crap. You might feel horrible, but you don't feel new. And if you think you do, you're not spending any time with new people. And again, I'm not trying to diminish your agony. You might feel worse than you've ever felt in sobriety, but you're not shaking alcohol out of your spinal fluid. Every part of your face is not moving in a different direction. <laughs> you're not a crap magnet. <laughs> You know how it seems like any crap in the universe just <laughs> finds its way to a newcomer? You're like a crap magnet, you know? You're not <laughs> so I'm not saying you don't feel bad, but you don't feel that bad. And I always say to myself, because I'm so non-judgmental, I just make evaluations, not judgments. <laughs> what? Um, that you're probably not spending any time with any. I, I had a guy in the back of my car the other night. I, I met him. We, my home group has a panel at a... Wonderful rehab uh, in our area, county rehab. Ah, just glorious. And uh, uh, this guy's sitting in the back of my car, and it's just a sweetheart, just a great guy. And he explained to me that his four uh, brothers and three sisters and both his parents were dead from alcoholism. They had either drunk themselves to death, overdosed, or had put a gun in their mouth. Nine people. And he looked at me completely honestly, and he said, I don't want to die. And I knew for sure. I mean, I just knew it. The first and the second step, again, because I'm doing this work, hit me in my heart again. I said to myself, I can't save you. 
I am powerless over your alcoholism, over mine. I can pick you up, take you to the meeting. I can sit you down. I'll lend you five bucks. I'll do anything I can to help you, anything. The one thing I can't do is I can't save you. I can't save your life. And I don't know if it's going to happen if you're not. Is it going to be, is it going to be ten people in that family that wind up dying? I don't know. Number one, I believed him when he said he didn't want to die. I don't know if he'll be able to actually be responsible to that wish. And I don't know if he's going to be able to weather the horrible initial storm, that terrible, wooden, hollow, dead time before God pries your jaws open and breathes life back into you. I don't know. But I know that I felt the first and second step on, a, on that incredible level. Now, if I'm not doing inventory, I'm already pissed off I have to pick up the guy. I'm pissed off, why me? Am I the only guy involved in this program? You know, all the crap. All the crap. All the crap. Without the 10th step, there's no 12th step for me. Right? So, because I'm in the car and I'm not pissed off about being there, I can hear him and go, I don't know. I love you. I'll pick you up tomorrow night for a meeting. That's the limited involvement. I've heard a guy say in AA, and I, I love when he, when he says this, says it seems that a sponsor's uh, job is to keep the newcomer entertained until God takes over. And I, I, I love that, because ultimately, ultimately, that's it, you know. Um, so when I work the steps with a guy, I get up to this point, I ask him if he's read that literature. If he has read that literature, I say, are you an alcoholic? If he says yes, I say, okay. Is your life unmanageable? Well, I don't know. Well, can you do some controlled crack smoking? Uh, no. <laughs> Have you, uh, okay, then your life's unmanageable in the area of crack. Can we move on now? Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, so that first step, and I don't care, you know, I don't care if a guy really believes it or not. I don't go... Do you really believe it? I don't give a crap if he really believes. Let's go. Let's let's get let's get going here. Because whatever level you're taking this on now, I believe it's been my personal experience that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger the more you get this thing. Then step two came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Not would, not should. I don't get to make an appointment that it's possible. Okay? It says, uh, there's a, a couple of lists in the big book. I, I, I love them in the first couple of chapters. One's a list of things that people say about us when we're drinking, and one's a list of things we say about ourselves. The things that people say about us, which I love, is, oh, you think he gets sober for They told him if he stopped drinking, if he'd get drunk, he'd die, and there he is, lit up again. Uh, um, you know, all of that stuff. And then there's stuff we say about ourselves. It won't burn me this time, so here's how. <laughs> For God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Or my personal favorite, I'll stop after the sixth drink. <laughs> now, I, I'm also a man who came home one day and emptied an entire bottle of wine into a 32-ounce tumbler and told my wife I was having a glass of wine. So by the time I get to the sixth drink, things get really interesting. And uh, another fabulous one, what's the use anyhow? Boy, don't you just love that one? At any rate, it then says on the bottom of 24, when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, let's say a person prone to the disease, prone to the uh, uh, this bizarre allergy, you know, uh, normal people don't have that allergy. My cousin Roz uh, has never dreamt about walking into a palace made of cocaine. Uh, my, uh, my uncle Milton has never dreamt about uh, paddling down a river of beer in a canoe. Uh, I have. I have. I, I just want to tell you, normal people don't dream about drinking. They don't. I defy you to produce one normal person who dreams about drinking, about having pitons and scaling a bottle of bourbon. Normal people don't dream about this. Alcoholics do. So if you're new and you're dreaming about drinking, well, welcome to AA. <laughs> And you know, it's a funny thing about the general anesthetic. I can't seem to get that out of my mind. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why it's so damned exciting. For the same reason that I used to get excited when I was told that I needed dental surgery. Normal people don't get excited about dental surgery. Normal people don't go, oh, dental surgery, dental surgery. 
And I'll tell you why. I leave out the middle. I, leave, I go right from announcement of dental surgery to painkillers. I leave out the surgery. I leave. <laughs> it's the same reason I was able to, my, my wife and I, before I got sober, a guy lent us his car and we sold his car. And, uh, and I know, and that was because we were, we didn't have money for the rent, big duh there. And I, uh, I looked into my wife's eyes and I said, you know, I'm so sick of being a, a punk, irresponsible kid. Let's not borrow money. Let's stand on our own two feet. Let's sell the car. <laughs> And my, my, my wife Nancy said, let's do. <laughs> and it's for the same reason. It's for the dental surgery reason. I leave out the middle. I go from let's do the right thing to sell the car. I leave out grand theft auto. <laughs> I leave out forging the pink slip. I leave out looking behind me in the mirror. I leave out the whole thing. I leave out the surgery. I leave out the blood, the sutures, then the agony. And that's what they're talking about here. When this this kind of thinking is fully established, why, Silkworth talks about, why would they possibly drink, considering the attendant misery that follows every time they do it? Not some of the time. Every time they do it. i got to tell you the story. Um, this uh, guy, who I sponsored for about 15 minutes, he was... Um, I took him down to my sponsor's home group, my sponsor's Paul, Paul O, Dr. Paul, and I, I got him down there, and he was being 12-stepped by Dr. Paul, uh, John A., Cliff R., this group, I mean, circuit speakers. Just He's surrounded by circuit speakers. I think he drank while he was talking to them. And um, they kept him sober for no seconds, like not a minute, you know? And I called him the next day all individually to let them know how powerful they were. Uh, <laughs> I said, do you know that the newcomer you talked last night, Cliff went, oh, yeah, how the hell is he? I said, you sent him reeling to a bar. <laughs> anyway, the guy's fabulously wealthy. I mean, the guy is a fabulously wealthy, incredibly powerful guy. He's drunken himself out of his job, drunken himself off the face of the map. They're paying him 100 grand a month to stay away from the office. He gets sequestered on a, a privately owned Caribbean island by one of his friends, so he won't drink. He stays sober till the day he gets off the island. He cannot stop drinking. He's dying. So I, I take him on. He, get, he gets me up to his house. He says, I got it now. I got it. I said, what? He said, look what I bought. And he brings out one. There's about 100 copies of the original big, big book left. The big, big pressing the, of the, the large book. And there's about 100 original copies left. He said, seven grand in cash. I got it. Meaning I'm never going to drink again, right? I said, wow, it looks perfect. He said, that's right. There's no marks in it. It's never even been opened. I said, so this has been handed down from loser to loser for 65 years. <laughs> and now you've got the loser book. <laughs> Don't open it. It'll drop in value. <laughs> Don't open that sucker. <laughs> Man, once this kind of thinking is fully established in someone without, with alcoholic tendencies, they've probably placed themselves beyond human help. I love that, probably placed themselves beyond human help. Now, it says on the first page of the fourth chapter of our book, and I, I love this, the first time my friend Larry ever read this, I'm, I'll tell you what he said. It says on uh, the first page of We Agnostics, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. <laughs> and it's tough. Die in a pool of my own urine, spiritual life. Tough choice to make. And um, <laughs> the first time that, he, <laughs> that my friend Larry ever read that sentence, he said to himself, well, how bad an alcoholic death are we talking about here? <laughs> No normal person would ever think of how, how, how bad an alcoholic death would that's, that's dental surgery to me. That's leaving out the middle. It's the death part. That's leaving out the death part. At any rate, it says that if you have this physical, bizarre physical reaction, it's gotten mixed up with this weird thinking. By the time we get to we agnostics, it says you have probably placed yourself beyond human help 
Lack of power was our dilemma. And now I think lack of dilemma is our power, pretty much, you know. Um, we had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that can solve your problem. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, that there's a power greater than myself if a man can say that he does believe, or is even willing to believe? We emphatically assure him he's on his way. We don't so then, okay, write us a check, buy the following literature. We say, you're off. You hit the floor running, you're in, man. You're in, you got full rights here. Now, if I say I've come to believe that a power greater than myself, a greater than myself, can restore me to sanity, and if the spiritual experience necessary for me staying alive is promised in the 12th step, it says having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, then all step two really is, is an admission of possibility is coming out of the gate, is me saying, you know what, I really think this could happen for me. I don't really believe it. Me, I didn't really believe it, but look at the look at the evidence. People are telling their stories here. Look at the demonstration around me, if any of this is true. You know, something, there's something here. So how many times have we heard people get to podiums and say, there was something there. I sensed something there. And it wasn't what was in their house, you know. And, um... So for me, I really feel that step two has for me been a really big hoop to jump through. That it's an admission that this thing can happen for me, and now I want to move forward. And uh, the description of step three in the next two and a half pages in the big book for me are uh, extraordinary. I want to talk to, about them a bit. I also want to talk about during the day about how I take the steps. In the morning, uh, I take the steps and, and uh, in a kind of formal way for me. And the way I take the first two steps in the morning is I simply say, I am powerless. My life is unmanageable. I know that you will restore me to sanity. And those are my first two steps in the morning, and it's just great for me. I am powerless. My life is unmanageable, and I know that you will restore me to sanity. I know because it's happened. Not every day. <laughs> um, but... Uh, it's happened, and I like it. I like the way it feels. You know, the pain is not anymore, is no longer the, the touchstone of spiritual growth for me. It's a touchstone of spiritual growth. How many times, and you guys are part of such a powerful fellowship here with so much enthusiasm. How many times have I found myself doing things in AA because it really feels good, because it's fun, because I like it, because I'm taking pleasure in it. I mean, for me, joy has become the touchstone of spiritual growth in a lot of ways. For me, now, you know, I, a friend of mine uh, talks about surrender. He says uh, he surrendered like Custer. Uh, all his men were dead. His horse was dead. Uh, he was out of bullets. And, uh, and five arrows were coming at his ass. And he said, I give up. And uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I get that. I, I, can, I can surrender that way. I, I absolutely get that. Another friend of mine says he, he only surrenders when he's back up, his, his back is up against the wall and the wall's on fire. And uh, I like that too. And I surrender when I'm in that kind of agony. But you know, I also, uh, at this point in my sobriety, for me, uh, joy is a, is a real big motivator. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. Um, on page 62, there is what I believe the most succinct and exact description of the savage, uncivilized mindset of the alcoholic that I believe I have ever heard. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven, driven is not nudged or influenced. Driven implies under the lash of, in slavery to. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably. Invariably means without variation, with no loopholes, always 100% of the time. Find that at some time in the past we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. I didn't get this. How could that be true? My aunt pinned my arms to my sides when I was a little kid so that I could be hit. How was that my fault? How did I make a decision based on self? I didn't. Is that excusable for her to do? Absolutely not. Completely unacceptable to treat a baby that way. What I didn't get was the difference between the event and the resentment. Was the event my fault? No. Was the resentment my fault? You bet. 
with the next 19 years of doing anything I could do to character assassinate her, to make her miserable, to deny her joy, to de deny her the good uh, will and respect of her fellows? Absolutely. What was going to kill me? The event of the resentment. You know the answer to that. Did I make decisions based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt? No question about it. The thing I didn't get, now I'm Jewish, I had a problem with Nazis. Call me a nut. Okay? <laughs> had I made decisions based on self, which later placed me in a concentration camp? No! Was the event my fault? No! But the fact that when I heard somebody with a German accent, I instantly hated them, wouldn't talk to them, was that my fault? You bet was my self-pity and my opportunism for my self-pity and playing the victim because of it my fault? Absolutely. The difference between the event and the resentment and what freedom to get that. Because, you know, I've been confronted with a lot of people in sponsorship who have gone through horrible stuff. And I can't tell them they haven't. I have a, I sponsor one guy who was systematically Sexually abused as a kid, he was abandoned by his parents with the abuser and forced to live with the abuser for years. Now, is the event his fault? No. Has he been damaged? Yes. Has it changed my relationship with him? Yes. If he gets into an abusive relationship, I, one thing I do with this guy that I don't do with other guys I sponsor, I, say to, I sit him down and I say, you cannot be there. I will not allow it. He never had anybody to protect him. So I do that with him. It's great. It's just great. Was Did he place himself in a position to be hurt by being filled with self-pity? By doing all? Absolutely. The difference between the event and the resentment. And one of the things, and this has been very interesting for me because I've taken it seriously. He, along with a couple other guys I sponsor, lived, uh, grew up in terrible alcoholic homes. They must sponsor other drunks or they'll die. They have to do this work on some level. It's, uh, it, there's an interesting twist for them that a lot of other people don't ha that have. Because of their upbringing, they have a notion somehow that the drunk is constantly trying to get over on them and take advantage of them. Why? Because that's what happened their whole lives. So one of the things I have to, we do together is we work the 10th step and say, no, he's not this, you're taking his alcoholism personally, is to get them free from that event so that they can out there, get out there and be in the world of AA. But it's, but, but I could, as a sponsor, I could say, oh, stop doing that. Well, they can't stop doing it. But we can deal with it. We can say, hey, you know what? This guy's just really sick. This has nothing to do with you. Is this too hard for you? If this is too hard for you, let's do something else. And it's, it, you know, a couple of times it has been too hard for them, but mostly they've been able to stay in it, stay moment to moment, and get the work done. Um, on page 61, uh, one of my favorite things, is they talk about the alcoholic in his cups or her cups taking one of two basic ways of manipulating people. And that is to either bully, and that's the way I fought. I'm a loomer. I like to loom. I like to loom so the light's behind me and I'm casting a shadow on her. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm a yeller and a loomer uh, or a crier. Love to cry. Uh, tyranny of helplessness. Works for me really good. I like to loom. I like to cry. Uh, if I can, uh, if I can work some lumen and crying into the same fight, I'm in the bonus round. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, it says there in step three that an alcoholic will tend to either be really magnanimous or a bully, a, a hostile, cursing, insane bully in order to get their way. Now, my usual MO, usual MO is I'm a sterling human being. I'm a hell of a nice guy. Then if you don't do it my way, you should die in a flaming car crash. But out, of, but out of the gate, and I never got it until I, when I ruined my sponsor, read me that, and I just went, Ugh. and then it says, it basically says on that same page, admitting, admitting he may be somewhat at fault, he's sure that other people are more to blame. I'm wrong, but you're wronger. <laughs> In the wrong contest, you seem to be winning. <laughs> Although I'm wrong. But my wrong is already nowhere close to how really wrong you are. <laughs> and um, that was so meaningful to me because I did it so much. So much that it, uh, uh, one more time in AA, it, you guys ate my lunch. You ate my lunch, ate my lunch, ate my lunch. So by the time he got through this section on step three, 
which again has been a step, which for me, I took on a very primitive level at first and has become much, much bigger for me as time has gone on. And um, on the bottom of page 62, it says, this is the how and the why of it. First of all, I had to quit playing God. Well, for me, that's been very meaningful. I can't boss people around in AA and assume that I'm stopping playing God. I can't be saying to God, you know, I think you can keep Saturn on its axis, but I don't think you can take care of my kids and manipulate them in a proper way. I can't, I can't do that. Well, got a laugh from the right person today, right? Uh, it's okay. She's great. Um, and this whole notion of stop playing, of stopping playing God, which for me has been a real cautionary tale in terms of some AA big shotism that I've suffered from in the past, uh, that I have to really be aware of because I'm prone to it, because I'm just so damn spiritual. Um, and uh, she. <laughs> just unbelievable. Finally getting the respect that I deserve. Uh, I have a friend named Bobby Ruiz. I want to tell you this story. Take a minute and tell you the story. He was a skid row bum um, who uh, w near the end went to his home and took off his crunchy clothes. They were all stiff from filth. And went and took a shower and one of his three little daughters turned to his wife and said, Mommy, when are you going to learn that you can't turn that creepy man into a daddy? He heard his daughter say it. He put the crunchy clothes on and walked out of his house. He went to a bridge overlooking the uh, train tracks down in downtown L.A. and stood on top of that bridge and said, God, if you don't want me to die, tell me now. A wind came up and blew him off the bridge back onto the bridge. He walked down to a phone booth, called AA, and never had another drink. And um, he's just one of the best guys I know. Uh, graduated of the Harbor Lights down on 5th Street. Great guy. And... Uh, he made a deal with God about his health and uh, started running and uh, went to run the uh, L.A. Marathon. And when you went down there, you had to fill out stuff about why you were running the marathon. And he wrote down, I was a Skid Row bum, the marathon. I made a deal with God. The marathon runs through Skid Row, and that's why I'm doing it. And the guys on Skid Row read the article and put together a cheering section for him when he ran through Skid Row. The, the guys were standing there with placards and stuff. And they wrote this because they wrote the article up in the L.A. Times, so the guys find it, found out about it. I went down, I had the honor of being asked by Bobby to go down to the Harbor Lights, the uh, Skid Row uh, Salvation Army place, to go down uh, and watch a ceremony uh, which was called the Hall of Miracles. And the Hall of Miracles is, you're inducted into the Hall of Miracles if you've come out of the Harbor Lights and you're sober for over three years. One of the tragic things about this is there was no news teams down there. What a terrible thing, you know, to not cover something like that. A room with a hundred people who've come off Skid Row and are experiencing this kind of success. But they weren't there. That's okay. I was. And there were and there were hundreds of people, you know, the families there. Everybody's dressed beautifully and their kids are running around. And this is, I thought of this one that, that baby uh, uh, gave me a little editorial there. Because I, uh, um, I used to get really angry sometimes when kids would bug me at AA meetings. And I still, you know, I, I, I that's a, can be a problem. But at any rate, what what really this this guy in the Salvation Army just straightened me out that day. He said something so beautiful because kids were running all over the place down there. He said, "Please do not allow the sounds of the children to make you angry or to distract you. These are the sounds of families that shouldn't be." And it just killed me. It was just so on the nose, you know, on the money. So sometimes when I hear a baby's voice at an AA meeting, it's it sounds like music to me. And um. <clears throat> then it says, uh, when we, uh, uh, it does what it does over and over again in the book. It talks about the difficulties that we've had that are real. And then it says, but we experience these difficulties in a way that will actually kill us because we have a sickness of the soul. So we have to take a different position. We have to quit playing God. We have to let God be the agent. We're going to be his kid. We're going to start following him on some level, even though we really don't know how to do that yet. What can we do? Well, we're going to really find out big time in a few minutes. And then it says that you might want to, provided that we, that we, we uh, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Kept close to him through step 11, performed his work well. For me, that's pretty much 9 and 12, doing, making amends, carrying the message, and practicing the principles. Okay? And if we do that, we become more and more interested in life as opposed to ourselves. 
We all know this to be true. If you've been on the program and done the work for any appreciable amount of time, you know that you will get out there. And I didn't know what a pathetic, tiny little Scott Redman life I had when I got here. I could barely do anything, talk to anybody, or go anywhere. I put my arm around my wife one night. She must have felt my accelerated breathing or smelled my breath, and I heard it just come out of her in a gush. She, and it wasn't even pointed. She just said, you disgust me. And I thought, yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. It was just the truth. That's where we had wound up. And, um, and my life's huge now. Absolutely huge. <clears throat> We felt new power flow in when we started thinking about what we could contribute to life. We enjoyed peace of mind. We discovered we could face life successfully. We became conscious of his presence. We began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. We were now at step three. Many of us said to our maker, as, he, as we understood him, if anybody would like to join me in taking step three right now, let's pray. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. We thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, we, that we could abandon ourselves utterly to him. I don't know what that means. I'm not going out and buying a robe now. I'm just... You know, I abandoned myself as utterly as I could at that particular time. And then it says something I've always loved, because we found it very desirable to take a spiritual step with an understanding person such as our wife. Fat chance. <laughs> our wife. Oh, yeah. Let's pray, honey. <laughs> I don't think so. Not that week. Not with a couple of months of sobriety under my belt. I was waking up at night and staring at her juggler vein pumping and thinking, couldn't I just press down on that? Or, you know, could, will that work? You know, I mean, I mean, I shortly before I got sober, uh, my wife came home and I had, uh, I was on the floor. I had uh, started cooking something and I died in the middle of cooking. Uh, I was. Uh, laying on the floor, holding a pan of eggs, and the stove was on, and my wife came in and kind of touched me with her foot and said, are, how are you? And I, I looked up at her, she tied and remember, so I looked up at her and said, I'm exhausted. <laughs> so she found an empty vial and an empty bottle, she called the doctor, and the doctor said, why are you calling me? There's a blue Jew on the floor of your kitchen. I mean, he's called the paramedics. So when my wife tells the story, it kind of gives me the willies because she always says, I hung up and, you know. <laughs> I cleaned up a little. And thought. And then I called another doctor for a second opinion. <laughs> um... So I, I, I wasn't going to take the third step with her. Uh, oh <clears throat> There's several questions. Sometimes people say, when should I start my fourth step? And there are three, uh, to the best of my knowledge, three places in the big book of AA where it tells you to start your fourth step. In Bill's story, he talks about that he took, started his fourth step. He did it with Ebby, uh, his first couple of weeks of sobriety in the hospital. Uh, right here it says that if you expect the third step to have any permanent or lasting effect, you sh it needs to be immediately followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in you. Now, a lot of different AA families, I know one AA family uh, uh, suggests that you don't do your inventory until you're six months. Some other AA families demand that you do it in your first year. I think they're all right. I'm just talking about what's in the book and what's been my experience. I don't think anybody's wrong about this because we're all staying sober. And my favorite place actually, where it talks about when to do a fourth step, is in chapter 7. It says, a guy might ask to start the work, but it might be a mistake because if he stumbles later on, he might blame you for rushing him. Then you turn the page, it says, but on your second visit, feel free to. So, <laughs> it just says, don't start it. The first conversation, don't get him on the inventory when you meet him that day, which I just, I've always loved. Um... I, uh, the inventory was explained to me at six months of sobriety, and uh, my sponsor read chapter five to me, 
and I had heard at that time all sorts of terrible stories about an inventory, about what to do about an inventory, about how scary it was. Um, oddly enough, on the last sentence of Chapter 5, it says, if you've done Step 3 and a uh, inventory of your gross or handicaps, you've made a good beginning. All it is is a start, you know? So if you're new here and you're scared of it, I just, uh, I urge you to, to just do it. Um, it's been my experience. It doesn't even matter how long it is. I, the longest fifth step I've ever heard was 22 hours. The <laughs> shortest was 15 minutes, and they're both dead. Because neither one of them continue with the rest of the work. You know, the third step will have a little permanent or lasting effect unless followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things that have been blocking me. And it's been my experience that the fourth step will have a little permanent or lasting effect unless it's maintained by the rest of the work. It just becomes some event, some big event. My life was a series of events. Not a life, just some stuff that happened. And uh, this can just become uh, in, in a little glass case, you know. Uh, my, my sponsor at Six Months of Sobriety sat me down. He read Chapter 5 to me. He worked the first three steps with me, and then he went back and he gave me instructions on how to do a fourth step from the big book of AA. And um, there's a lot of, I don't know, controversy. A lot of people do it a lot of different ways. I was told to do three sections of the inventory. I was told to do three columns of who I was resentful at, why I was resentful at him, and what the cause was. And my sponsor gave me a little kind of shorthand for it, which has been very good for me. And he called it SPAPS, S-P-A-P-S, Self-Esteem, Pocketbook, Ambition, Personal Relations, and Sex. I'm resentful at my father for not playing with me when I was a kid. What, did it, what is it it affect? It, did it affect my self-esteem? Yes, I put an S. Did it affect my pocketbook? Not really. I put a dash when it doesn't uh, affect something. My ambition? Yeah, my ambition is to feel like a fully, you know, grown man or whatever. I put in a personal relation, absolutely. Sex, not really. So I just put a dash. So I always put a dash when it doesn't affect something, and I put the initial when it does. And after a while, with that shorthand, it was just helpful to me because I was able to write my resentments kind of in a more facile way. And then when I read them, I knew the shorthand, and I was able to spit it out that way. So that was one thing that he uh, had me do. The other thing he had me do was very interesting stuff. Number one, he asked me to ask myself, every time I wrote something, is this resentment my fault? Now, when I initially wrote my inventory and I came to him and I read my inventory, very few of these things were my fault. <laughs> she knows the truth. And the fact is, is if I, if I finally am able to turn that corner and take a look at it, if I really realize the difference between the event and the resentment, it is always my fault. There is no possibility of the resentment not being my fault. The event is a different case. And it was, so, again, so I can't, for me, when I went, how could I have possibly sat down with my aunt and apologized to her if I had never separated the event from the resentment? But I want to tell you, when I sat down with that aunt and I apologized for refusing to open my wedding gift that she gave me in front of her so she would to deny her the joy of seeing me open the gift. I mean, mean, mean stuff, you know? And, you know, it, and I carried that into AA. You know, when somebody, uh, I don't like certain AA speakers. I know you guys love all AA speakers, so we're a little different, but there's a few that uh, kind of I find sort of annoying. And um, so what I would do in the old days, if somebody said, boy, I heard this guy, he was great. I really liked him. I'd go, oh, no, you didn't like him. He's no good. He didn't like him. No, no. He liked him. He just said he liked him. But why do I have to change his mind? Because I somehow have to character assassinate this guy. And until I got it, until I did an inventory, I did that a lot. You know, I, I haven't done it, thank God, in a long time. If somebody likes somebody, why would I possibly try to talk them out of feeling a little closer to God through somebody else? You know? And that's what I did with my aunt. So he asked me to... Take a look at, was the resentment my fault? Which I found out, you know, it was a trick question, you know. <laughs> and now you know the trick. <laughs> and something that was really valuable to me, because in the description uh, of, of the inventory, it says on page 66, sometimes it was remorse, and then we were sore at ourselves. 
and the resentments I had against myself were just remarkable. Now, I, I had a lot of resentments against myself, but don't get me wrong. I hated you way more than I hated me. I mean, I hated me fine, but nothing compared to how much I hated you. I hated you. I'm not a, a suicide guy. I'm a homicide guy. That's just where I go. I, you go first. I vastly prefer your death to mine. I always have. And I am not knocking the suicide people. This is not a put down at all. I mean, I, I, I just think it's sort of the flip side of the same coin, you know. And But I, I'm, a, I'm a homicide guy. <laughs> but what he asked me to do was, every time I wrote a resentment, to ask myself, Scott, do you have any resentment in connection against yourself in connection with this? And boy, it was really helpful to me. It really helped me. You know when a dentist goes in and sees a little pinprick of a hole in the tooth, opens it up, and it there's like a cavern in there? That there were certain areas of my life that I was able to gain entrance to in that way and say, oh, man, and the, the shame and guilt I felt around that was just unbelievable. So that expanded my inventory also. Um, if you're new, I want to share with you now uh, what used to be my favorite uh, sentence in the big book of AA and if you're new, it could be yours, too, if you'd like it to be. It uh, starts on the page, bottom of page 65 and continues to the top of page 66. And what they're assuming is that you have written down a list of resentments. You have written down a list of what people have done to you. And they don't argue with you, okay? And they say, if you're looking at this list, they say, the first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. <laughs> that's all for today, right? And I just used to read that before I'd go to bed. <laughs> Don't read the next two pages. The next two pages will destroy your life. Okay? Because what the next two pages put forward is the following notion. That you don't just not like stuff. No, 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 no. You hate with a hot hatred that you wake every day in water like a little flower. You care for this hatred. You nurture it. You develop it. You gain, you pick up more evidence to support the hatred. You proselytize and try to carry the word about the hatred. And perhaps get some converts over and bring them into the hatred pipeline. <laughs> you hate with a hate that eats your brain and your heart and turns your life black and throws you out of your own life. You don't just like dislike stuff. If you could just dislike stuff, you'd be in very good shape. Just disliking is a lofty goal. Let that be something maybe you'll attain at a later point to just dislike something. <laughs> Now, it says on that same page, it says something that so explained my life to me. It says that for every minute I spend in resentment, I'm squandering the hours that could have been spent in a, in a more worthwhile way. And it's true. For every five minutes I spend in resentment, it's five minutes wasted. For every five minutes I spend in resentment, uh, it's five minutes I could have been fishing or doing something I really like. It says I cut myself off from the sunshine of the Spirit I drink again, and for me to drink is to die. So it's also five minutes I've cut myself off from God. So every five minutes of resentment is 15 minutes down the toilet. And I just want to tell you what a powerful explanation that was for me. My life was exhausting. How many times have we heard people over and over again? I mean, it's, it's the hallmark of AA. How can I do it all? I'm doing so much. Who the hell ever knew that I could do this? My life, I mean, who ever even thought it? Because my life was so exhausting, and I believe that's the explanation for it. When you're on that spiritual hamster wheel, when you're wasting that amount of time, it's, it's just damned exhausting. And what, one of the things I've been set free in AA, and of course, uh, another common uh, malady that we've seen in the program, is when people start realizing themselves on that way, some of them, certainly not all of them, then become disconnected to the reason why they're able to do that. And they spin off. And they get cut off from the foundation. And some of them do quite well. And some of them drink and die. And some of them drink and suffer horribly. And um, I had a sponsor who was an incredible example. When he uh, had a hard time, he did more. And when he had a good time, he did more. He always did more. So whenever he had a tough time, he never had to say, geez, I better start doing this. He was already doing it, you know. 
And uh, what a great example for me. I've just always done more. And uh, not because I'm smarter or a nice guy or anything like that. I I can't tell you how many times when I was new, I heard got people get up to podiums and say, you know, I, things got good and I drifted away. And I just didn't want to be one of those people. I just want to, I, I, I really heard it. I really heard it loud and clear. Things got good and I drifted away. And um, so that's been a tremendous help to me. This description of how I experience resentment. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.